Good morning, church family. How good is it to be together this morning? Man, I am feeling that this morning. I don't know about you guys, but I had just a little bit of an unexpected week. Things didn't go how I planned. I didn't get all the things done that I had hoped. But what I was resting in this morning as I was thinking about it, it's like, man, Sundays kind of come as a reset, don't they? This beginning of the week, this moment where we can say, whatever the week was behind us and whatever the week was ahead of us or is going to be, we can have this moment to take a deep breath. And it's the only place that we can do that is in the presence of God. We can bring, if it was a celebratory, amazing week, or we can bring, if it was just kind of a bummer week. But we can all come together in that and rest knowing that the presence of God is big enough for all of it. And we were made to do all of it and do it together. And I'm just really thankful. So guys, thanks for having me as I am. <laughs> and let's, let's like create that space for each other, right? To be whoever we are and wherever we are. And I'm just grateful. So whether you are here online with us or you're right here in the room, it's not an accident. And I'm so glad that we get to do it together. So thanks. Thanks for being a part of the body that accepts me as I am too. Guys, if it is your very first time here, Wow, thank you for coming and checking us out. We're so thrilled that you're here with us. You guys will see on the back, we have these new stickers on the back of one of the seats in front of you, and there are two QR codes on that. One of those is for if you're brand new here, we wanna know that you're here. We wanna help you get connected, and that is one of the ways that we do that. The other one is just a new way that we can be generous and give to the church family to help keep the lights on, to help keep the doors open, and help just ministry happen here, because incredible things are happening here all the time. One of those things that's happening today is starting point. So if you've been hanging out with us for a little while, but you aren't connected yet and still have questions, or if today's that very first day and you're like, I don't know what's happening here, starting point is a great starting point. It was named that on purpose. So right out here, out these back doors, immediately after service, we'll have some real friendly people in that room. There's a room right there. There's a banner that tells you what room to be in. That is just a space where you can go and be for about 15 minutes, meet other people in the church, get your questions answered, and learn how to connect and how to be a part of what's going on here. If you've been around for a little while, and you're ready to go a little bit deeper in that connection, not just with others around us, but with the Lord and learn a little bit more about what he's got in store for you, Rooted is the place to start for that. That is our small group ministry here at The Point, and that's where we start. That's where we begin this journey of being together and being in him. And so registration continues for that. You can go on our app, you can go online to do that, and, and just start to get connected. Right here this morning, we are gonna get to do something that's so sacred and so incredible that we get to do this together. We are gonna take part in communion. And so you see those elements up here. And friends, if you know Jesus as your savior, that's it. That's the requirement for coming to the table. Isn't that amazing that we get to take in who he is and who he is in us in that way? If you have not recognized him as your savior, don't take the communion, take him in. Let today be the day that you say yes to him for the very first time. And this is the space where we get to do that. Because I just think that the Lord has something really incredible for us. And what a stinking glorious day to be together. So can we get up on our feet and just start to celebrate that and start to soak in what he might have for us this morning? Let's do that together in song. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you And I was breathing but not I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you
Well, good morning, church family. How are we doing this morning? Man, so glad to be with all of you this morning. Uh, glad to meet some new faces this morning as well. We're glad, thankful that you're here. If you're visiting us for the first time, it's a great week to visit. You heard about that starting point heading up. I'll talk about it again later in the service, but just excited to meet all of you. If you're watching us online, we're glad that you're here. Uh, you know, every week over 350 people join us online to worship. It's incredible. Uh, our church is big. Our church is wide. God's kingdom is big. Our kingdom is wide. And we're here to uh, encounter what I believe is the mystery of our our faith, Jesus here and now. Do you all know that? Jesus here and now, not what? Dead, Dead and gone. Uh, that's an incredible reality as we engage uh, with God today, as we encounter Jesus today. We open up the word, which is not just words on a page, but it is the living word that seeks to bring answers to the questions we have in life. And we've been journeying through a series here in July called You Ask For It. Uh, if you are new with us, a couple months ago, we just asked for your questions. Lots of people's questions. Lots of people submitted questions, and we've been talking about all kinds of stuff. And we are in our third week of You Asked For It. If you missed any of those, you can check us out, go to thepoint.com, check out all the social media places. You can go back and watch all the answers to the questions. We've just been having some good conversation, and that continues today. We have an interesting question. I, we had several questions around this word, sanctification. Uh, it's kind of a fancy church word. We hear it uh, sometimes within the church. Maybe you're coming here today and you were like, what the heck does that even mean? What is sanctification all about? What does it have to do with my life, with my relationship with God? So we're gonna talk about and unpack what this word is and what it means. Here it is, sanctification, the definition, the action of making or declaring something holy. Oh man, all of a sudden things just got real. <laughs> so what is, and this, let me just kind of give you a little bit of a breakdown through the narrative of scripture. This is actually God's intention for you and for me. Did you know that? If you start back in Genesis and you work your way through the Bible, God is taking his people whom he created to be with him in relationship from the very beginning to be set apart, to be people that were special. Humans were created with a purpose to be holy. And then something happened in the world, we call it sin, we call it evil, lots of things uh, have names for it, but that move us away from that original intention of God. And this, this journey that we are on with God is really to find ourselves to be holy. God gives us this command, believe it or not, in scripture, he says some crazy things like this in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. May God himself, the God of peace, here's that word, sanctify you through and through. That something is happening in our lives from the moment of finding Christ and the moment of the realization that God created us for something more than we're living now and he wants to do something in your life. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have this word blameless that kind of comes to mind and God begins to unpack for you and for me what his intentions are for us in this life and the life to come. And he kind of takes it one step further, even in, in 1 Peter 1, 15, it says this. I, and I find this, uh, the kind of verses you read in the Bible and you go, oh, shoot. Anybody ever have those moments? <laughs> Anybody? Am I the only one? I open up the Bible and read things sometimes and go, oh, shoot, what does this mean? But just as he who called you is holy, just as God is holy, so what? Be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. <laughs> we have one AM, amen, and 400 oh shoots. <laughs> be holy as I am holy. God says to you, now how many people are accomplishing holiness today? <laughs> are you holy? Nobody raised their hand. Well, we have a problem, church, <laughs> don't we? Because God says to be holy as I am holy. I was actually reading in Hebrews chapter 12 this morning, just letting this sit within my heart. It's not on the screen. But it says, in order to see God, in order to, to experience God, we must be holy, it says in Hebrews 12. Whoa. Was, oh, shoot. So, so what do we do with this holiness thing? Because if we're honest with ourselves today, our idea of holiness, what holiness means, and then we look at our lives, most of us would probably say that our lives are not holy. That we're, we're not a reflection of who God is in the world with our mouths, with the activities of our lives, with, oh, oh here's one. Uh, how many people are your, is your thought life holy? 
<laughs> Y'all are getting a little nervous now. <laughs> Imagine for a moment a world where all your thoughts were just made reality and everybody could see what you're thinking all the time. Everybody else sweating. <laughs> Be holy as I am holy. You will not see God unless you are holy. So here's the thing, because I don't feel like I'm holy often, but I feel like as we're reading some of these scriptures today, that God is pretty serious about holiness. He, he wants you to, to experience this process of, or, or this experience of sanctification where we will have our lives consecrated, set apart for a greater purpose, for a greater existence, for a fullness of life. That's God's intention for you, but something for most of us kind of goes haywire and we can't claim holiness. So what, what, is, what is going on in this picture. And I've been, I've been really talking with the Lord these last few years of my life, dealing with this tension in my own life because I desire to see God, anybody else? I desire to have the life that he wants for me, but I often come up against this tension that I'm not the person I think he wants me to be or reminders consistently that God, even though you're in my life, there's still things that I think say do that don't really line up with who you say I should be. And I live in, sometimes in this perpetual cycle or rhythm where I get like this vision or experience from God. He wants to do something in my life. And then I go to Monday. <laughs> and it feels like all the old stuff comes back and tries to lay its claim upon my life. And I feel like there's some brokenness in our thinking and understanding of what holiness is all about. And I wanna take a journey with you today to maybe give us a little bit of a reorientation that will bring to us an understanding of what is sanctification really about and what does it mean to really be holy as God is holy. Because here's the truth, when holiness is something we do, I want you to let this kind of simmer in your heart a little bit, right? When holiness is something we do, we are doomed to fail. We take others down with us. Now, let me give you some explanation about that. Because many of us, in, in, as we think in our human minds, God says, be holy as I am holy. We immediately go to thinking about how, the, how I need to change the stuff that I do in my life. And out of that spirit rose this, this tool of the devil, I believe, but this spirit of legalism. Over the past hundred years, maybe you've experienced this in the church, in your experience with church life. I know countless thousands of people who had toxic experiences with church because of this very thing that comes from the sentiment, especially in our tradition of our church, to be holy is a desire of our lives. We, God wants us to be holy. And then we go about the work in our lives of trying to do all the right things trying to check the boxes, trying to look the right way, trying to do the right things. And we have an entire, more multiple generations who have lived in a toxic experience of church where they are told they have to be one way in order to be in relationship with God and then consistently experience life where they're not that thing. Where we consistently experience that I'm a failure and I'm a mess. God could never love me. I'm not worthy of his love because every time I come to worship, I'm told that I'm less than and I'm not enough. Holiness can be in itself a toxic invitation from the enemy of your soul. Because I believe in our human spirit, we all oftentimes take what God says to us as these commands that we have to achieve that we are unable to achieve in our own strength and power. But what if holiness wasn't something that we do? And if holiness isn't something that we do, then what is it? <laughs> right? Because we love black and white. We love in the church to be able to say, do A, B, and C, and then all will be well in your life. But what if holiness was something a little bit different? I wanna take us on a little bit of journey through the narrative of scripture that I believe will help explain what I mean by holiness not being something that we do but it's something a far, far together different than that in Genesis. We're gonna go all the way back to the beginning. If you're looking at your Bible, it's all the way to the far left. It's the starting thing. We're gonna start in Genesis one because I believe God sets in motion some precedent for our lives to help us understand what he's doing in us and what he longs to do with us now to bring us back to what he created us to be in the first place. It says in Genesis chapter one, verse 26 through 27, then God said, we talked a couple weeks ago about the Trinity, right? Then God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit said, let us make mankind in our image. It's a pretty profound statement. 
Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We have this word image repeated several times because God's intention was to image himself, to reflect himself into his creation, you and me. So God's intention from the beginning was to, to reflect his image into us. And we're gonna kind of unpack and, and lead through the scriptures what it means for God's image to be imprinted upon you. It's, it's profoundly important that we, you and me connect to this idea that right now as you sit, you are a reflection of the image of God. That's really important especially in terms of this discussion of what does it mean to be holy as God is holy. But like humans often experience, we have this created intention of God and then something comes and messes it all up. <laughs> Here we check it out. It goes on to say in the scriptures, now Adam and Eve who were created as what? The image, the reflection of God, living in perfect unity with God in that original garden scene of Eden. They were in right relationship with God, but something happened now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he came to the woman and he said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? See, Adam and Eve had some instructions that God gave them. He gave them this place of, of beauty, this place of bliss where they were united with God in complete harmony. But the one thing that God set in motion to make sure that that happened and stayed the same way was that man would continue to reflect the image of God, which meant that they had to submit to the authority that God was the creator. And in order for that to work, God in his creation set in motion one little tree in the middle of the garden where God said, in order for you to continually submit and surrender to my image, to my authority in your life, there's gonna be this tree that I want you to continually remember to not eat from. And by not eating, you will be submitting to my authority and my image in life. And the serpent comes to the woman and say, but did God really say that? It's interesting how often the enemy of our souls manifested as the serpent here in this story, uh, lead us to question the things that God speaks into our lives for our good. I wonder how often you begin to question the things that God sets in motion in your life for your good, where you begin to wonder, is that really so? He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say this, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. And the serpent, uh, this uh, initiating lie of the enemy says you will certainly not die. And the serpent then began to craft this lie that has seeded itself into the human heart from that moment on. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now remember the intention of this tree in the beginning, the reason God put it there was to be a, a place of surrender to the authority of God in the lives of Adam and Eve. They could continually come and say, God, you are our creator. We are imaging you. We are reflecting you. So we will choose to trust you that you are seeking our goodness. And the lie of the enemy comes and seeds itself into our hearts and says, but can you trust God? And invites the woman and the man eventually in this scenario to say, but what if God was really working against you? What if God was being selfish and keeping something from you? He says, if you eat it, you surely won't die, but you will become like God. The better translation for that passage is you will become like a God. So was in this moment, was convincing them to see something different than God intended for them to live in and experience in their life. Because the true power of sin in this moment, and in every moment since, in, our, in my life and yours, the true power of sin is to convince us and all of humanity to see an identity that is independent from God. Do you notice what the serpent did for Adam and Eve there? It says, if you eat of this, you won't die. Instead, you will be like a God. 
You will be elevated in, your, in yourself. You will experience a new identity separate from the one God intended for you. And in seeking our own identity, we lose connection with our true identity. And in the Genesis story, we see not only the presence of this first lie that leads humanity away from its intended image to be the reflection of God, to take up their own image, and all of a sudden, sin, the choice to move away from God's identity, manifests itself in some consequence for the first time. In Genesis chapter three, verse six through seven, it says this, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable, for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And then she also gave some to her husband who, were with her, who was with her, and he ate it. And then, check it out, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were what? They were naked. They said, oh shoot, we got no clothes on. <laughs> so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, I wanna, I wanna kind of dive in here a little bit. What, there's another word for what happened here, for the realization that they were naked. When you realize that something is wrong about your life and you try to cover it up, what's, well, that's another word. There's another word I'm looking for. Anybody, can everybody feel it? Oh, say it right here. You all feel it in your spirit. Shame. This moment they moved away from God's identity for them and they began to take on the reflection of something altogether different was the first moment that they realized that something was wrong with their lives. And their initial instinct, as with all of us, is to try to cover it up. To try to cover it up. Because shame convinces us that we're, we're not good enough. That we're broken. You notice this repeating rhythm in the life of all of us as humans that is still present. I can never be enough, I'm not good enough. And then that spirit engages with this call of God to be holy as I am holy, and we think there's no way. Because shame is a reflection of the reality that you are living with an identity that you were not created to live with. Sin has said, reflect this image instead of the image of God in your lives. And friends, the real tragedy is the further we get from our true identity, the closer we get to losing ourselves forever. This puts even hell into a new context because it, it, it moves away from this retributive punishment that God dishes out on humanity that he's upset with and instead the grieving heart of God is revealed as humanity chooses to live a life other than he intended for them to live. As we, all of us, in our repeated pattern of sin that began in the beginning, move further and further away from the identity that God desired to give us in the beginning. The shame ravages our lives and we become people who begin to bear images other than God intended. I was thinking about this in my own life. I was, was a couple weeks ago, we... We had actually a month ago, we had our family together and my mom was in the living room and we were talking together and I, I was sitting there talking with my mom, just sitting on the couch. And I, as I sat there, I kind of like turned my body sideways a little bit and I crossed my legs and then I put my, my hand on my chin. I kind of sat kind of funny, you know, and I looked up and realized that my mother was sitting the exact same way. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, help me, I'm my mother. <laughs> Have you ever had those moments where you realize like you, you're just, your mannerisms are, you're like an exact replication of your parent? And oftentimes I think in my life how few are the moments where I catch myself reflecting my creator and instead I catch myself reflecting something else. Where I image this brokenness into the world. Maybe it's anger for you. You reflect some pain that you feel deep within that starts to just show itself to your friends and your family, and your spouse and people at work. Or maybe it's hatred or violence or pain, trauma. I mean, you, 
fill in the blank. Maybe it's addiction for you. Maybe it's your thought lives being ravaged by lustful thoughts. Over and over again, within the heart of humanity, within the mind of humanity, we are continually led to this original lie that says, live as a reflection of something other than God created you to live with. I wonder whose image you're bearing this morning as you sit in your red seat at the Point Church or in your home online, maybe in something is coming vividly to your mind and I'm imaging something other, I'm reflecting something else into the world that was never what God intended for me to reflect. And it brings us all, all the way back to this original question, what does it mean to be holy then? Because my life is littered with evidence that I'm not holy. And I believe that's true, but how does God give us an answer? What, what, what does it mean to truly to consecrate ourselves in a way that we can live the life that God originally intended us for, for us to live? In 1 Peter, where uh, he talks about that, be holy as I am holy, it's actually a reflection of the word from Leviticus, or this word of God from Leviticus uh, chapter 20, verse 7. It says, consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am the Lord your God. I was talking with Pastor Matt this past week and we had a wonderful conversation and I captured this moment uh, where actually, I think he texted to me, so thank you for the Matt, for Pastor Matt texting this to me. But it says this, he said this, Leviticus 20 verse seven is in the imperfect indicative tense. Pastor Matt's like a total Bible nerd, right? So here it is, it's in the imperfect indicative tense. It is not a command, oh, that was interesting, that would be imperative, telling us to be holy and to do all this stuff and try harder i.e. legalism. See, this tense happening in Leviticus 20 is all about identity. And I love this phrase. You are holy, not because I am holy. You are holy because I am holy. Do you see the, the difference? You are holy. It doesn't say be holy because I am holy, or as I'm holy. It says you are holy because what? I am holy. That's a huge difference, folks. Be holy, you are holy because I am holy. God is inviting you to see a new vision of who you are. And, he's, and he's, he's starting to show us that holiness is not about what you do because you can't achieve it. Holiness, what if holiness is something that we are? This beautiful quote from a book called Fullness in Christ uh, says this holiness in human beings or things is present only when in relation to God. That is, no finite person or object has any inherent holiness. The holiness of things or persons is derived and dependent. That means you can't accomplish it through your own actions. This derived holiness is present only as the person or thing is in right relationship to God. You see, my friends, holiness is, is about proximity, not process. Come on now. That's just where you get really excited because this is good news. <laughs> when it says in Hebrews 12 that you can only see God if you're holy, the good news is that holiness is not dependent upon the things that you do in your life. But holiness is a reflection of your connection to Christ. You are holy because that means God's holiness rubs off on his creation. So what he said in the beginning, let's, let's get together. And here's a great idea. Let's make mankind in all these other images of the world. Is that what it says? It says, let's make man in our image. And in our image, we create, created mankind, man and woman, as a reflection of the holiness of God. May they learn that their lives are holy because they were created by a holy God. What you do does not make you holy. Who you are with makes you holy. And we discover who we are as we discover who he is. Oh, come on now, church. Because, and, and here, this is the tough, you, you thought the tough word this morning was be holy as I am holy. This is really the tough word. Because an, an even more tragic problem that we face in our lives is that we can't see who we are. Truly. 
And you may be living in the grip of sin. And do you know what sin is? It's every influence that is trying to get you to reflect it other than God. Everything. Whether it's an attitude, a relationship, a substance, addiction, a moment of pain, you name it, you, you got it in your life. We live every moment of every day with the constant press of evil to have us live and believe that we are something other than God created us to be. And the longer you journey down this road of reflecting an image other than the one that is in you, the further you get from the fullness of life that is representative of, of Eden and abiding in union with God where there was no shame. This, this symbol of, of nakedness. Nobody knew they were naked. They're just walking around because life was good and they were who God made them to be. But the moment you begin to image something other than God's created intention for your life, shame enters the picture and points at all the places where you're broken and you're lost and God could never love you and God could never be with you. And the lie of the enemy is trying to keep you from moving back to this place where your eyes would truly be opened to see who God made you to be from the beginning. But friends, here's the good news because God is still calling you to be holy. He's saying, be holy because I am holy. But the only way that you catch the vision of that, the only way that you, are, that you move from all of these things you've been reflecting to the world in your life to the image that God made for you is that you gotta discover who he is. And this is something that we do not do well in the church because we wanna come on Sunday mornings and just say, God, give me a moment in time where poof, everything changes. <laughs> And I can stop, you know, with all this pain or you can heal it or I got no money and you can just give it to me. Like we are like quick fix, easy button people. But friends, this is inviting us to a lifelong, and I'm not talking about just life here and now in temporal reality. This is an invitation that God set in motion from the beginning to walk forever with him where we gaze upon him and what we see is a reflection back of who he created us to be. So your holiness is dependent upon what you're looking at every moment of every day. It goes on to say in Hebrews 12 too, this beautiful passage, fixing our eyes on Jesus. I love that word in the Greek, it means gazing. Gazing upon Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. He scorned its shame and its lies, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, accomplishing unity between heaven and earth, humanity and God himself. But this points us to the pathway forward. How do we experience holiness? We gotta to learn to fix our eyes, to gaze, that's the Greek word, aphoreo, aphoreo, looking away from all else to fix one's gaze upon. That's our call today. And maybe you need to get serious about the moments and minutes of your life being spent, not reflecting an image that is other than the one God intended for you. But maybe you need to get serious about fixing your gaze upon Jesus. This is not a momentary thing. Holiness is not a momentary thing. It is a walking moment by moment with my eyes turned away from all else and focused on the one. The one who is holy, who makes me holy. We're gonna receive communion here together as we worship him. And I, I wanna invite you to see communion differently. And we're gonna receive it differently this morning. We're gonna, we're gonna all, from our seats, you're gonna move to your right and you're gonna come down and then return uh, on the left. So your right, come back on the left. And as we see the elements of communion this morning, I want you to come and see them not as something that you receive, but this is an image that God is inviting you to bear. This is God showing us who he is. His blood poured out so that we could be one with him. His body broken so that we could be one with him. He's saying, this is the life I long for you to live. Come look at me. Come gaze upon my life on the cross. Gaze upon my life in resurrection over, over death defeated. Gaze upon my life and live in reflection in your own. My prayer for you is as you receive the elements of communion, that he might reveal to you all those places where you're not reflecting the image he created you to reflect. Heavenly Father God, now I pray. 
as we worship together, as we come before these elements of communion, this holiest and sacred of moments where we truly turn our eyes from all other things and we gaze upon you, God, body broken, blood shed, that we might see that we are holy because you are holy. And we might find our lives again. Pray for my friends who are bearing images other than their own today of anger, of pain, lust, brokenness, violence, hatred, depression. God, that today they might come and turn their eyes towards you. That we might be healed and made new. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you now as we stand, we're gonna stand and worship today. And as you come, what you're gonna do again is you're gonna exit to your right. You're gonna come down and receive and then return back to your left. Let's receive this morning. from the inside I've been washed from the inside
I know it was the blood Could have only been blood Hallelujah, hallelujah I know it was the blood Could have only been the blood Status is nothing. The King of all kings came to serve, washing my feet, covering me with your love. And if more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of is all I need Take everything oh, Take everything You are my life and my treasure The one that I can't live without so here at your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down.
take everything, Lord, just mold our hearts to be more like you. Mold us into your image. Lord, we love you. starts to tremble at the light that you bring when you walk into the room every heart starts burning and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you oh we worship you oh we love you and we love you and we'll never stop can't live without you Jesus we love you and we can't get enough all this is for you Jesus starts to vanish every hope the situation ceases to exist and when you walk into the room the dead begin to rise cause there's resurrection life in all you Let that be our prayer this morning. I want to make no mistake this morning that 
what we've experienced today, this call of God to say we are holy because he's holy, is, is not just something we experience in the moment. If you're tired of living in patterns of brokenness in your thinking, if you're tired of living in patterns of sin in your activity of life with others, if you're tired of bearing an image other than the one God created you to, to bear, then the answer isn't just found in encountering this truth. The answer is saying, I'm going to today and tomorrow and the next day, I'm going to learn to gaze upon Jesus. And that means getting serious about this thing we call in the church is discipleship. That we want to walk in the dust of Rabbi Jesus. We want to, you, if you want to make this a change in your life and live your best life, it comes today making the decision to get serious about getting in the living word. We have a wonderful tool in our app. If you go to the point, search for it. It's under worship tab is the chronicle. Get serious about reading God's word every day. Get serious about being a part of the community of faith. Sign up for Rooted today. If you haven't done it, if you aren't a part of a community, sign up today. No more excuses. The life that God calls us to live is right in front of us. We just must make the choice to daily gaze upon him instead of everything else. Amen? If you're new with us again, we're so deeply honored that you would be here. We would hope that you would take 15 minutes to eat a wonderful donut on us and meet some friendly faces. If you head back out, go to the right. If you're wanting to know what the point's all about, you're new, you've been here a little while, go out to the right, find the banner, eat a donut, uh, find a smiling face. Thanks so much for joining us today. May you gaze upon the beauty of Jesus this week. Amen.